Hey, we are live. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to wait a few minutes. Let everyone log in. Give it another minute or two. Where is everyone tuning in from? respond in the chat. It's always exciting to see. We've got San Antonio, Texas, Bellevue, Washington. We've got Seattle, Seattle. Lots of Seattleites. Let's see. Los Angeles, California. Good be from that DC and North Carolina East Coast. Okay, we're going to give it one, I'll give it one more minute. Okay, I think we can begin. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Paulina. I am Book Larder staff, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon or evening um, for our author talk with Lauren Co to celebrate her new book, her beautiful new book, Pyometry. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Book Larder, we are a cookbook store here in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle. Typically, we host these author talks in person at the store, but of course, with COVID, we transitioned to online. And I like to say that it's, even though we miss having people in the store, um, it's been a huge silver lining to be able to host authors and interviewers and even guests, attendees uh, from all over the country, if not world. It's been really neat. Um, but today, we get to celebrate, like I said, local. Um, Seattle-based um, baker, blogger, and author, uh, Lauren Coe. Um, and she will be in conversation with fellow baker, Lindsay Sung, um, who is um, the woman behind the very popular blog, Coco Cakelan, um, as well as the author of the same um, book, book with the same title, excuse me, um, they will be in conversation today to talk about Lauren's um, beautiful book, and they will save about the last 10, 15 minutes for questions from you all. So if you have any questions for Lauren, there should be a Q&A sidebar at the bottom of your screen. Um, type your questions into there, and Lindsay will be moderating and, and asking those, reading those questions out loud for Lauren to answer. Um, if you have any comments or want to talk to other attendees, there is a chat sidebar to do that, but please direct all questions to Q&A. Um, also, this author talk will be recorded and we'll be putting it up on our Book Larder YouTube channel within the next 48 hours. So if you missed any part of it or had to log off early, um, you'll find it there. And at the top of your chat, for those of you who haven't ordered 
Lauren's book yet, um, at the top of the chat, I did add a link um, where that will direct you to our website to order it. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Lauren and Lindsay. Hello. <laughs> hey, Lauren. <laughs> Hello. I have my iPad on this like really precarious setup with like like 14 books and like things leaning up against it. So <laughs> to get like a good angle. So <laughs> I yeah. mean, is it really Zoom if there isn't a sketchy <laughs> set? Well, I wanted to do one of those cool background thingies, like be in space, but I don't <laughs> yeah. know if that. I, I've tried, but. <laughs> oh man. That's okay. You? Your wallpaper is pretty cool. I thought so, you know? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, so how's it going? Oh, not too bad. It's a pretty exciting week, I must say. <laughs> yeah. book, book birth on, on Tuesday. Yeah, Geometry is officially out in the world and people can buy it and people have been buying it. It's so wild to see it in their homes and their hands and oh man, what a life. Yeah, was it so trippy <laughs> holding your book for the first time when you, when you oh. got it? Yeah, that was crazy. My publisher said that they were sending me my first hard copies and it, that I should expect it the following week. And then it took like three more weeks. So every day I was checking the mail, checking the front porch, like, is it here yet? So, so it was pretty exciting when it finally arrived. Well, I have my copy. Oh, yay. So beautiful. And I, I, I got yeah. it and, and I, like tore open the box and then sat on my couch and just was like, I, I, my, my, my mouth kind of did drop. I was like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> really nice. Um, yeah, and I'm, what's the photographer? That's somebody that you're, is he like a local person or? Um, no, he's actually based in Northern California. And I mean, when I started this kind of book writing process, I didn't know anything about anything. Um, so basically, I reached out to my agent and my editor and asked for recommendations of photographers that they had worked with or they thought maybe would be a good fit for kind of the style of food that I create. Um, and he was wonderful to work with. So you do all your your photography on your on your Insta. So is that something that uh, <laughs> you're thinking you'd have to do for your book? Like the photography? Um, uh, that is like a whole like fake it till you make it situation because I take all my uh, photos with my iPhone and my backdrop is like a $10 black chalkboard from Home Depot that I've had for like five years now. So I definitely knew that I was going to find an actual professional to help with the book. <laughs> How did the book come together? Like, was it something that you wanted to pursue or did somebody approach you or like an editor or like, how did it, how did it uh, come to fruition? Yeah, I mean, I never thought that I would ever write a book. And um, basically when my Instagram started going viral and blowing up, I was mostly just kind of overwhelmed and trying to like stay afloat to even consider what my opportunities were. Um, I was really fortunate to have um, lots of agents and editors kind of reach out to me through email and I, basically put them off for like many months. I just kind of ignored them because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know anything about the publishing industry, had not considered writing a book. Um, and then, you know, a couple months later when I had started to like settle into things and catch up, um, hopped on a bunch of calls with agents and asked a ton of questions, um, ended up picking one who I love so, so much. Um, and she basically helped kind of guide me through the process. We developed a proposal together. And I think, you know, the concept of a book that I would write was pretty straightforward. It was to like kind of share the pie art and tart art that I make um, and include recipes so that people can also make it in their homes. And then we shopped that proposal around, uh, signed a book deal in 2018 to my great fortune. And then I basically spent all of 2019 furiously working on this manuscript. So I had to learn how to develop recipes while I was supposed to be developing recipes. And um, yeah, coming up with new designs and 
um, interesting flavor combinations. Uh, and then once I kind of finished doing all the recipe testing, spent a lot of time at my neighborhood library and my neighborhood coffee shop doing all the writing. So, Aww. quite the I mean, ride. Sorry? Quite the ride. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, That's pretty, yeah. yeah. It's pretty amazing that you, yeah, the book deal and, and everything came out of Instagram. You know, like, um, I know that you and I have talked previously about about social media and, and sort of how, how we're feeling about it. And what what's what's your feelings these days about about you know social media, staying engaged, sort of the, the, <laughs> the cycle and the rat race of it all, and and how do you how do you cope? I guess. It's a, yeah, I mean, I think it ebbs and flows. I recognize that what I do now is like a huge privilege. I have a background in social work and nonprofit administration and never in a million years imagined that I would be managing a social media account or that I would be working in the food art space um, or that I would be, you know, this like semi-public personality with so many eyes um, in, you know, with this giant community. Um, so, you know, I feel really grateful to have been given this opportunity. And I know that, you know, having such a big platform is a huge responsibility. So um, it's come with lots, it's opened lots of doors that I know that I otherwise wouldn't have had access to. So that's been really fun. And, you know, I have gotten to do things like write a book, um, which is wild, but it's also, you know, it's the internet, it's social media, it has its ups and downs, pros and cons. So, you know, some days I, I really feel the malaise, um, especially in a year like this where we're all kind of stuck at home, everything feels kind of blah. Um, in some ways, this community can be really positive and life-giving and other times it's just like, feels like work yeah. um, as with any job, right? You know, some days you really love it and some days like you just put in your time. Yeah. <laughs> And then, you know, sometimes oh there are some voices out there that just make it sometimes unpleasant and that just comes with the territory. So, so to the people who are not aware of Lauren's hashtag, can you explain your, your brilliant hashtag? I love this. And when I first, the first time you, I saw it, I, I was laughing pretty hard. But uh, <laughs> tell us about, and, it, and it's become a bumper sticker. So yeah. <laughs> tell us about that. Yeah, yeah so but what does I, it look like baked? <laughs> exactly. Um, so when I first started my Instagram account, I really kind of got into this with the art of it. I loved the creating part. I loved designing. I loved, you know, the pristine, sharp, clear designs. Um, and so I was mostly sharing photos of pies that were unbaked or tarts that um, are in their like final state, but aren't baked and pretty much like or just lots and lots and lots of questions be from people being like, yeah, but what does it look like baked? And, you know, on one hand, it's a legitimate question asked in good faith. I get it. It's a pie. We are curious what the final product is. But um, in the beginning, there was kind of this tenor to these questions of like, yeah, well, your work is like, we devalidate your work or like, it's not real. Like, it doesn't mean anything because it transforms. And, um, you know, initially I felt kind of defensive, like I'm just doing this for fun. And, you know, yeah. I like the designing part because, you know, I enjoy the process. Um, and this hashtag was just kind of like a tongue in cheek, like, ha ha, let me just like preempt the questions or the comments. But I mean, I will say most of the like feedback and the interactions that I have are really positive and I'm really thankful for that. But um, you know, this is part of just the territory and you just roll with the punches. So we've kind of turned this into this like, haha, we know that this is out there and we acknowledge it. And um, yeah, it's, it's part of the local kitchen experience now. And um, I guess it kind of ties in with my philosophy of, you know, the transformation of an art piece doesn't kind of detract from its value or its aesthetic at any stage of its journey, you know, even if it changes um, in the oven, which it will. Uh, <laughs> if I sat in an oven for an hour at 400 degrees, I would look a little different too. Um, but 
I think that we can appreciate, you know, the beauty or the value of art at, you know, any stage of its kind of process. So that's just what I think. And Lauren, you actually are fairly new to baking, right? Like it hasn't been very long since you started making pies and now you have this amazing book and all these followers and fans, like, yeah, that's pretty it's, crazy. So you it's started very off crazy. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I made my first ever pie four years ago when I moved to Seattle, but I did kind of grow up you know, casually baking. I like to say that I come from a family of phenomenal eaters. Mm -hmm. So I had the great gift of growing up with amazing home cooks, um, being fed really delicious meals. Um, it's we're the kind of family I talk about this in the book where we will sit down to lunch and before we even start eating, we're already talking about what we're gonna eat for dinner. Um, so I feel very spoiled to kind of come from that background. Um, and I you know, have those cliche, wonderful memories of like seeing my grandmother cook and bake and being in the kitchen with my mom. But you know, in my Chinese Honduran American family, not a lot of traditional apple pie happening. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So what kind of stuff did you grow up eating then? Or like with your grandma and your mom? And um, yeah, a lot of, I don't want to say fusion, but I was lucky that my mom kind of cooked everything. So my dad is from Hong Kong and my mom's family is from China, but she was born and raised in Honduras. Um, and I spent all my childhood summers in Honduras at my grandma's house. Uh -huh. So we had Honduran food, we had Chinese food, we had, you know, spaghetti and meatballs some nights. We had, you know, ramen. And then also my grandmother is an amazing cook. So we had paella with seafood, um, enchiladas, Honduran enchiladas. And then, you know, desserts that I grew up with were tres leches cake or flan. Um, so, you know, a, a wide range of flavors, um, but not a lot of pie. That's amazing. How did your family end up in Honduras? Yeah, that's one of my favorite stories. It's kind of crazy. So my great grandfather was escaping some sort of conflict or something in China. Um, and so he took a boat to San Francisco. And, you know, back in the day, this is like 1901, took six months, maybe he gets to San Francisco. Um, yeah. Sorry, oh, nothing, just remarking. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so he gets to San Francisco. He can't find any work because the climate is extremely racist. So family legend has it is that he took a donkey and rode down through California, down through Mexico, through El Salvador, and then, you know, ended up in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Uh, he took on a Spanish name. His name was Joaquin Salvador, and he learned how to speak <laughs> Spanish. Um, and then just kind of built up a general store and, you know, built this reputation for being so trustworthy that people in the like neighborhood and community would bring their cash to store at his place because they trusted him more than the banks. Um, oh so yeah, once he got established, he sent for my great grandma and my great grandpa or my great grandma and my grandpa. And they went over my grandpa spent a few years there. He went back to China, married my grandma, brought her back. She was 19, like, I think a socialite in Shanghai. And, you know, the rest is history. They had five children. My mom was the oldest. They're all born and raised there. Um, and then eventually they all came to the States for college, uh, which is where my mom met my dad in California. And that's where you're from, right? Yes. I was born and raised in San Diego. Oh, San Diego. <laughs> Why do you say it like that? Just, um, just I, you. I really like Seattle and I enjoy living here, but I am dying to move back to San Diego one day. Is that something, <laughs> that, is that something that's in the cards or? <laughs> uh, ben and I have been saying it's in our five to 10 year plan, but we've been saying that for like five to 10 years. So who knows? This Seattle move was uh, like a work related thing or? Um, well, we were in Boston before this, um, and we just wanted to come back to the West Coast. Uh, both of us are from here. We wanted to be closer to family. Um, I was way over snow blizzards and like horrible winters. <laughs> um, and, you know, it was between Portland, Seattle, and San Diego, and we regret not choosing San Diego, but we're pretty happy in Seattle, so. 
<laughs> so let's get back to pie. So what sort of, if somebody was a complete novice and they, they were like, hmm, pie book, what would you, what would you sort of let them know about pieology? Well, I am a self-taught home baker who made her first pie four years ago. So I really truly believe that if I can do this, anybody can. Um, I worked really hard to write this book for everyone. So the target audience is anyone from a professional chef to home cooks, to armchair bakers, to eaters. Um, there are simple recipes for people who have never made a pie or a tart before. And then there are or, you know, more advanced designs once you kind of progress in your design journey. And I also want to mention that I had a couple recipe testers who helped me who do not work in the food space. They're like doctors and like moms in real life. And uh, many of them had never made a pie before. And uh, in the course of testing my recipes, um, learned how to kind of pick up these skills and were able to practice and now they really enjoy making pies and tarts and you know some of their results were really really beautiful and we were so pleased that they were able to kind of follow the instructions but also now kind of branch out and express kind of their own creativity and make a lot of these things their own so I really hope the intention is that this book is meant to be very accessible, and I I really think it is. I think I think it's so awesome. Like, it's got full on step by steps, you know, yeah. which really demystifies some of those really, you know, scary looking designs. But actually, they're they're yeah. doing, you know? absolutely. I'm a visual learner, so you know, there are obviously written instructions, and then also lots and lots of process photos to kind of help clarify what, you know, words can't always express. Yeah, and then <laughs> this is one thing I, I, I said in my book, which is no baby is ever born knowing how to make a perfect pie crust. You know, it's, it's <laughs> practice. And, <laughs> um, it's just practice and just sort of, once you practice more, that's more of an intuitive feeling and, and sort of knowing, oh, did I add too much water? Or um, is it cold enough, you know? So yeah, like what are your, what are your tips for like, you know, your top three pie tips. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I say is just to jump in. I know pie has this like finicky, terrifying reputation and I was intimidated in the beginning, um, but you know, pick a recipe, maybe one in pieometry and just make it and keep making it. I learned by doing over and over and over, you know, part of it is researching on the internet or looking up tips or, you know, checking cookbooks, but it's also just by like, manually practicing over and over. So um, jump right in, practice, and then for like specifics on pie, make sure the golden rule is to keep everything cold, right? So keep your butter cold when you're making your dough. Um, when you're about to roll out your pie crust, make sure it's straight from the fridge. Uh, once you have constructed your full pie and finished your design, chill it again, and this is all in the instructions, but I like to pop my pie in the freezer or the fridge to make sure everything's nice and cold before it goes in the oven. And that kind of helps prevent the crust from shrinking and to preserve that design that you work so hard to create. I know the, the great fear is, is like a tough crust. A tough <laughs> yeah, crust. yeah. So don't <laughs> overwork your dough either. So pie dough is not like bread in that there's no kneading or you know you aren't kind of touching it a ton just be gentle with it. I basically always think like, just do it with your mind, like barely touch it, you know? You're just like, <laughs> just like two seconds of touching it. Mind <laughs> tricks, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't need to look like a full formed dough ball or anything, you know? Exactly. There's butter and floury bits and... Mm -hmm. So what are some of your favorite recipes in pieometry and what inspired them? <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the big ironies of this journey is that I don't really have a sweet tooth. So it's funny when people are like, I, it's, it makes me so happy that you found your passion and that you get to pursue it. And I'm like, I don't even like eating pie that much. I don't know if it's a passion, um, but this is really fun. Um, I do love savory pies. So there's a handful of savory options in there that I really love. There's a tomatillo short rib pie with a spinach crust that's really good. 
Um, and then, you know, holiday season is coming up and one of the pies is a bacon butternut mac and cheese pie with a cheddar chive crust. And that was kind of inspired from previous years of celebrating uh, at Friendsgiving. Um, and then for sweet ones, there's a white carrot miso pie that I'm really proud of. Um, yeah, what's it's kind of like- the, What's the oh, treatment sorry. and the and the miso? What do, you do? what do you do? Is it a roasted carrot or? Um, yeah, so they're cooked carrots. I think I boil them just in, and then puree them. So they're really soft and smooth and then add um, cream and a little bit of miso. So it's just barely sweet with a hint of savory to keep it interesting. And it's got this light texture that's kind of like cheesecake, but like light and it's made with vegetables. So you can feel great about eating it even though it's a dessert pie. <laughs> and then I pair it with a black sesame crust, which has um, a really fun speckled look and then also a nice crunch for, you know, textural contrast as well. And I'm going to definitely try that one. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, like fairly early on in your in your pie career, I guess, was it a couple of years ago, which is pretty still still early on since you've been only only been doing this for four years. But tell me about your Martha Stewart experience. <laughs> The Martha Stewart experience. Like that's, that's really oh exciting. I'm so scary. Yeah, I feel like every experience that has come with this journey has been totally wild. And I'm always like, what? <laughs> um, so yeah, a couple months into my account blowing up, I got this email from a producer from the Martha Biggs show telling me that Martha Stewart was scrolling through her Instagram on her personal account and somehow stumbled across some of my pies and then told her team, like, I don't know who this lady is, but please find out who she is and let's bring her to New York because I can't figure out how she constructs these designs and I would love to learn, which like, what in the world? That's crazy. I'm just a humble nerd puttering around in her home kitchen, like messing around for fun and somehow things that I'm making in my little home kitchen have kind of gone out into the world. So I had the opportunity to fly to New York and bake in her test kitchen, which was like really intimidating because this was very early on in my journey. Scary. I had never been in one. There's yeah. all this like fancy equipment that I didn't know how to use. There was somebody to wash my dishes for me. Um, I felt a little embarrassed about it. Um, and then I got to film two episodes of Martha Bakes with Martha Stewart herself. So we got to make my tan gram tart and my spoke pie and um, yeah, exciting and also incredibly terrifying. <laughs> oh my gosh, did you have to take like a Valium before filming or? If I had one, I probably would have. And I also like flew in on a red eye, so I hadn't slept too. So I was just like a bundle of nerves, but um, <laughs> Quite the experience. And was she nice? She was very nice. She just kind of like floated through the kitchen. I was make, like prepping everything. I was like, oh, oh my gosh. Oh man. Yeah. Keep it together. <laughs> yeah. um, and then how did you, I mean, do you remember who it was that sort of blew up your Instagram? Like, was it reposted by somebody crazy? And then it sort of just, you know, it kind of grew from there or? What was yeah, your so, Yeah, um, I started my Instagram account August of 2017. Um, and it was kind of like steadily growing against all odds. And a month in, I posted my spoke design. Um, and by after that, I hit a thousand followers. And then a month after that, Design Milk, which is like an online design magazine, reposted one of my pie photos and that was basically the catalyst that just like poof, everything blew up so um I remember waking up this one Sunday morning and looking at my husband Ben and being like oh this account named Design Milk reshared one of my photos like I had never heard of them but I clicked over they had a million followers at that time I was like whoa that's cool um, and then I had a couple of friends text me and be like, they never reshare food photos. Like you're on here. That's crazy. And then my phone just blew up that day. I gained 8,000 followers in one day. Um, and then it just like didn't stop after that news outlet started reaching out. And, you know, I got the Martha Stewart opportunity. 
Um, and so that was October of 2017. And by December, I hit 100,000 followers. Oh my goodness. Um, so I, I was, I, I started following you, at, it was a lowish number, you know? So I was one of the earliest. <laughs> <You're> original. <laughs> Thanks for being part of this community. And also it's this like wild thing where, you know, there's a lot of food bloggers that I've followed since college or that I've known about. And now like I get to be friends with them or I have opportunities to interact with them. So, you oh, know, it's crazy. It's crazy and it makes the world so much smaller. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things I really like about Instagram. Like I have love hate with it. And right now I'm like, the yeah. permit zone like I haven't posted and I just haven't been on it's but, there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know meeting people like you and other other food people and that's that's who I I miss interacting with but and that's what I, I like about it is just some of the cool people I've met and making actual connections you know like yeah people, totally. it, it, I'm always like oh their captions are funny or oh they left a good comment you know and then I'll, I'll interact a bit more and then it's, <laughs> like a oh, dm you know little conversation and then <laughs> say, it'll be like hey, you want to go for coffee and so it, i've definitely met some cool friends you know and, and now i've got friends all over just because of it so yeah totally i think as a shy introvert i've also learned a lot about <laughs> saying yes and you know taking measured risks like i don't talk to strangers i personally don't really reach out to people i don't know on the internet um but <laughs> you know, people have reached out to me. I've, you know, met up with people like you and have built some really great friendships this way. So um, yeah, this journey has come with, you know, a lot of unexpected gifts too. How does it feel being a shy introvert and having to do public stuff? Interviews <laughs> <laughs> and like things like this Zoom and- Yeah. Does it, do you uh, find it or is it sort of more like you've done it enough now that it's like, hey, I can do this? <laughs> yeah, initially the learning curve was pretty steep. I have a lot of stories uh, with people who reached out and I was like, oh my God, no way, never. I will not appear. I will not teach a class. I will not do that. Um, and then eventually I did. And um, yeah, I think with practice, it's it's gotten a little bit better. Um, you know, things like Zoom and being able to do it from home is really nice. It's like the in-person, like big credit events that still give me a lot of social anxiety. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's also like exposure therapy, right? I've done a lot of these things now and it it gets a little bit easier every time so yeah yeah usually I'm I even before this I was like oh my gosh I have like a stress fever <laughs> but uh, it seems fine yeah just a casual conversation yeah and then book larder that's the that's where we first met was in I know the that was when your book came out I did a little cake demo and then that's our that first time we met in person so that was yeah. I love book larder back when we could meet in person and gather. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So yeah, what's it like in Seattle right now? COVID styles. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I can't really speak to the larger the city at large. I don't really leave my house that often. I go grocery shopping when I need to. Um, luckily, I get to work from home. So uh, have mostly been, you know, continuing to bake from my own kitchen and have been focusing on like book stuff so far. Uh, but I am starting a new residency with the Pastry Project here in Seattle. They just built out a new space and they are a program that uh, provides um, like free food training or pastry training to um, people with barriers to education and entry into, you know, jobs in the food space. Um, and so I'm really excited to kind of share their space for the next couple of months and hoping to start up, you know, in-person workshops again, probably really, really tiny private classes yeah. um, or maybe yeah. virtual ones. But um, yeah, we'll see kind of how things continue to play out in the next couple of months, but hoping that I can start venturing out again if things improve. Virtual, virtual pie class seems like it'd be pretty good. Yeah, I haven't really dove into it, dived, whatever the like connotation of that is. Um, but, you know, maybe it's something that I will consider. I prefer that kind of person to person interaction. Um, but, you know, if we're all kind of stuck at home for the foreseeable future, it might be something I have to pivot to. 
And so has, has COVID affected your, what were you, were you planning like a big tour for your book or any traveling plans and stuff like that or? Um, in theory, I think because quarantine started so early, we kind of knew that there wouldn't be a lot of like a traditional book tour or anything. Um, I was kind of hoping that I would have made it to New York at least, or um, done like some sort of East Coast swing to go visit all my old friends in Boston. Um, but, you know, we roll with the punches, we're here. And, you know, the nice thing about being able to do these virtual events is that um, lots of different people get to participate. There's kind of no barriers in terms of transportation or geography. Um, so in a way it's, it's been really fun to kind of do these events and, you know, see that, um, them be a little more accessible. So. So is there any other facet of baking or cooking that you're interested in? <laughs> Considering you picked up pies and, you know, have now exploded into the, the pie and pastry <laughs> baking world. Is there any other, you know, dessert or foods that you're, you're wanting to nail? <laughs> um, I don't know, I keep thinking about this. Like, how can I pivot my art and design style into something else? Ideally savory because, um, you know, I don't really have a sweet tooth. Although sometimes I think like, thank God I'm not really good at making pizza and bread because then I would just like really have a problem because then I would eat everything I make and it would be serious. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think now with the book, out, I have a little more brain space and capacity to do some more experimenting and try new things. So um, who knows? I'm open to kind of exploring other other baked goods or other things. Would you ever do like a YouTube show or anything like that? <laughs> My husband is watching. He's laughing and rolling his eyes because he's been trying to get me to do YouTube for years and years. Um, and I've just been kind of like, <laughs> Well, I don't really want to be on screen. <laughs> but yeah. maybe, I mean, never say never. So yeah, it seems, it seems like, yeah, that video is obviously sort of where it, it seems like you, there's, you can have a huge audience and a huge reach and, you know, and actually also monetarily it can be pretty good, you know, sponsored and sponsored posts or sponsored videos, etc. And I mean, yeah. I don't know, my, I have like 300 followers on my YouTube, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I started from zero. Yeah, got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, any, and you have some TV appearances coming up as well? Uh, I think so. Uh, <laughs> it's all kind of a blur. I'm like drawing a blank, but um, yeah, doing all kinds of fun things. I'm sure I'll be sharing about them on my stories or on my website. So for anybody who's interested in hearing me talk anymore, <laughs> you can stay tuned. <laughs> um, and Thanksgiving obviously is huge in America. So I live in mm -hmm. Canada. It's not, it doesn't have that same huge excitement as it does in America, but what are you gonna do for Thanksgiving? Like, do you have some pies lined up or some new pie ideas or? Oh my gosh, I haven't even planned for this year because <laughs> you know, it's 2020 and like who even knows what's going on, I think. I'm just mentally trying to make it to the election and like hoping for the best. Um, yeah, I mean, normally we like to host uh, Thanksgiving here. We like to have, you know, our family come. And uh, I think last year or the year before we had both of our, both sets of parents and siblings come and spend Thanksgiving with us. I think that will probably stay put this year. Um, or Ben's family is in Portland, so um, maybe we'll drive down and see them since, you know, we've all been kind of safely quarantining. Um, but yeah, I haven't really thought about it. What are some of the pies in your book that you would recommend for Thanksgiving specifically since it's coming up? Yeah, so there's that butternut bacon mac and cheese pie with the cheddar crust. And that was inspired by our annual Friendsgiving gathering. So we always host a Friendsgiving brunch um, because, you know, everybody has so many Thanksgiving meals. Everybody gets kind of sick of it. So we do a brunch spin. Um, so that one's a good option. And then there's a turkey pot pie in there with a woven top. And that's good for either a main course or also a great way to kind of use up a lot of those turkey leftovers. Um, and then 
for dessert, I'm always looking for like unorthodox, like original spins. So I do have a pumpkin and black sesame pie, which for, you know, people who are traditionalists and have to have their pumpkin pie on the table, that could be a good option. Um, or something like a cranberry curd tart, which is a little lighter, it has like a nice bright tart flavor profile to contrast with a lot of the like heavier, richer desserts. Um, and then there's also a caramelized pineapple pie, which is, you know, totally out of left field for Thanksgiving. But um, for me, it was inspired by like family meals where, or family barbecues, where we always grill pineapple and sprinkle some cinnamon sugar on there. And I've incorporated it into a pie. So it could be fun to do something totally different. I love the idea of a wild card Thanksgiving. You know, exactly. it's a wild card year, so why not? <laughs> yeah, like growing up, we would have like, you know, classic dishes like turkey and mashed potatoes and vegetables, but we'd always, you know, throw in some chow mein in there, like, you know. Exactly. Fried rice and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I like the idea of a pieology pies giving. <laughs> so like just okay. a, a pieology themed Thanksgiving where it's all pies, because you could go from appetizer all the way to dessert with your book. Yeah, maybe I'll start that. I'll have to think about it. A full pyometry buffet. And then I'll virtually join you. Yeah, and then we'll just like <laughs> die of food coma. <laughs> I'll watch you eat. <laughs> yeah. I'll take my own. <laughs> or you can make your own, yeah. Now that you have the book, can we <laughs> and we'll just eat over Zoom. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to just check out this Q and A. So pardon my big hand. I see there's some questions. So I'm just going to click on that. Oopsies. Oh yeah. So if anyone has any questions for Lauren, you can um, type them up in the old Q and A. And then. Do the best. Uh, yeah. Okay. So do I go bottom to top? Okay. So from Susan Lum, she asks, can the pie crust and the filling be made a day or two ahead before creating the top design? That's a good question. Yes. And the, okay, answer that first. Oh, okay. Um, yes, that's the beauty um, of pie making is that sometimes it could be, a, it can be a really lengthy process because there's a lot of resting time. You make the dough, it has to rest. You make you roll out the dough, maybe it has to chill again. You make the pie, it has to chill again. You bake it, that's another hour or two. Um, so what I love to do, and this is really great for holiday prep, is make a big batch of pie dough at once, let it rest in the fridge for you know whatever the allotted time is, and then I freeze it all. Um, so then whenever I need to make a pie, I can just pull it out of the freezer, thaw it in the fridge overnight, roll it out the next day. Um, I also like to make my entire pie um, and then instead of baking, I just freeze it solid and then I wrap it up in plastic and keep it in the freezer. Um, and then whenever I need a pie or have the opportunity to bake one off, I just pull it straight from the freezer into the hot oven. Um, and that is a good way to kind of, you know, break up the process. And also, you know, if you have some free time now, bake up all your Thanksgiving pies, stick them in the freezer and then when it's time, you can focus on all your main courses and your side dishes, and then all you have to do for dessert is pop your pie in the oven. Okay, and also, great tips, Lauren. Also, from Susan, are the pie crust and filling made by Lauren, or do you take recipes and then tweak them? Um, initially, I was, you know, when I was first learning, I was just kind of doing what people do and Googling recipes on the internet. Um, and then for this book, worked really hard to um, develop my own recipes and try to put spins on classics and find, you know, flavor combinations and designs that felt different and unique. Cool. Okay. Anonymous attendee inquires, Ooh. where do you find your inspiration for your pie tops? Good question. The short answer is everywhere. <laughs> um, pretty much, you know, I'm always looking at the world around me and soaking it all up. But um, specifically, I'm inspired by things like architecture, furniture, textiles, color. Um, I have pies and tarts in my feed and in my book inspired by uh, patio furniture, um, bathroom tile, bamboo purses. Ooh, bathroom uh, tile. Kind of tile. 
Yeah, um, <laughs> basically anything kind of geometric and textural and with lots of color pops, but also um, I take inspiration from, you know, seasonal produce. So I'm a regular person shopping at the regular grocery store in my neighborhood. Um, I buy what's on sale. So, you know, right now apples and pears are on sale. So I'll probably, you know, build something around that. Or, you know, maybe I have a bunch of mangoes in my fridge that are getting a little wrinkly. I'll try to build something around that. So it's kind of inspiration is everywhere. And then also trying to use what I have. Love it. Love it. Okay. Anonymous attendee also asks, what do you feel that you have learned from Pi? I like this question. <laughs> Philosophical. Okay. Yeah. I mean, oof. So, so many things I could say. Um, I touched on this a little bit, but just kind of learning to say yes to things that feel scary and intimidating. So um, one kind of jumping into this journey and riding the wave, it was like, well, we'll see where this goes, even though like, I don't know anything about social media. I'm not a professional baker. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had a blast and had all these opportunities that um, I otherwise wouldn't have had as an executive assistant and also like saying yes to people who say hi and then seeing friendships come out of that so um yeah and you know I always tell people like you really never know where life will take you um there's you know hope ahead I was feeling pretty like lonely and sad at my job and just really unfulfilled and kind of lost um and was pouring creative energy into a hobby that I really enjoyed and it became something that I get to pursue full time, um, which is a huge privilege, but also, you know, you never know. So kind I love of, that. That's, that, that's just super inspiring, you know? Yeah, take opportunities you have. Maybe what makes you happy isn't something that you're, you know, like desperately passionate about, but could be could become something that is really fulfilling. So. Aww. Yeah. Um, well, congratulations on all of your success. I have to say, oh, thank it's really you. inspiring. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just still reading. Okay, Michaela Loeffler asks or comments. Lauren, your artistry really comes through in your color combinations and use of pattern. Did you have any other art practices before you decided to start making pyometry? What drew you to combining food and art in this way? This is a great question. Oh, thank you. Um. I've always loved art. I've always loved design. Um, I've, you know, have no training in it. I never pursued it professionally. I mean, I took some like basic art classes in middle school and high school. Um, I love going to museums when I'm on vacation, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and I always love creating. Um, and I think that kind of what I do is just this lucky intersection of art and design and baking and also feeding people I love. Um, so I don't know that it was necessarily an intentional like, I'm going to find a way to make art because of this, this and this. It just kind of like, I loved creating, I loved baking, I started making pies. I was like, oh, this is a fun medium to work with. I think I can create some like fun designs and, you know, the process of weaving these pie crusts or cutting out fruit was really therapeutic to me. And that's just kind of how I kind of went down this path. And uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> um, yeah, it does, it does seem like a very yeah, therapeutic, your re repetition would be, I think it, would be, it seems like it would be pretty relaxing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, maybe yeah. it's not for everyone, but I really enjoy it, enjoy the process. Um, Okay, so Simone asks, do the colored pie doughs other than the cheddar or Nutella taste similar? Um, yeah, surprisingly. So I only use natural ingredients to color my pie doughs. So it's um, either beet juice or spinach juice or carrot powder. And surprisingly, the color does not come through in flavor, um, which actually makes it really nice because then you can make these really fun colored crusts on sweet and savory. Um, I think maybe the spinach one has a little bit more earthiness um, that pairs really well with the savory fillings, but it's not so strong that, you know, it tastes like a salad on a peach pie kind of thing. Um, Which yeah, might, so. not, might be a bad combo either. So um, <laughs> Robert 
asks, what led you to choose the pie for the book cover? This is kind of your most famous pie, the, the, the spoke. Yeah, so it's kind of become my brand. Um, it's been dubbed the modern lattice. And I felt like Ooh. when you think loco kitchen, that that feels like it encapsulates a lot of things. And then with the title being pieometry, I felt like it had to be a pie. Um, and that kind of, it was a good summary of my design aesthetic and my style and kind of what was inside the book. So. I love it. I also love how the, the back looks like your geometric tart. One. Yeah, we went, we had a lot of back and forth um, <laughs> developing this, this cover. I tried really hard to get the unbaked photo on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I lost that battle. Um, that could be the yeah, book of your next book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Somebody suggested that I should publish a book of like all my paisasters and like that feels like a really compelling sequel. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> um, Susan asks, which pies would you recommend for Christmas? Ooh, Christmas. Um, the cranberry curd tart is um, a good one because it's got this bright red hue. You can pair it with something like kiwi and have that kind of fun green and red play in. Um, also cranberries are you know, I think in season right now, so they're easier to get. Um, I don't know, last year we served the white carrot miso pie for dessert and um, that was a big hit. So if you're into desserts that kind of are less sweet on that spectrum, that's a really good one to kind of end a meal with. Asians love the less sweet, not exactly. too sweet. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try that one for sure. <laughs> Um, and another question is, how do you keep your dough light and flaky when incorporating color? That's actually a, a really good question since we were talking about not wanting to overwork dough when mm -hmm. you're, when you're um, prepping. Yeah, so my process for making colored dough is this, pretty much the same as making my regular um, plain dough. It's, you know, you're still, I basically substitute water for the vegetable or fruit juice, like one for one. Um, and then in some of the dough recipes, I add yeah. like a powder. Um, so really there's nothing different in the process. You're still kind of flattening the butter and then incorporating it into the flour mixture. And then as you add your liquid, fluffing it through your dry mix and then just gently bringing it together. So um, same exact technique, the proportions are almost identical. Um, so, you know, I always recommend for people who are starting out with pie, practice with that all butter plain pie dough. And once you've mastered that, you can literally make any of them because you just kind of substitute in color and um, an alternate liquid. Awesome. Okay, it looks like there might be another question. Oops, sorry about my big old gross hand there. Okay. Yeah. Um, how did you come up with your crust and filling flavors in various combinations for your pies? Yeah, um, I am always trying to like push the boundaries on things. I um, always fear boring. <laughs> so, you know, apple pie is the classic. So I'm always like, how can I make that different? How can I twist it in a way that feels special or unique? Or, you know, how can I do this design in a way that's never been done before? Like, how do I take these regular ingredients and reimagine them in a way? Um, so that's just kind of, you know, I wanted to do a peach pie because it's like really delicious in the summer. How can I make that a little interesting? Add some, maybe blitz some mint with the sugar and um, just add a little bit of color and extra flavor. Uh, this really does feel yeah. like a thoroughly modern but accessible, you know, the recipes and the, the pies. Because I mean, yeah, there's a million cookbooks out there with with apple pie, pecan pie, pumpkin pie. But I, when I was flipping through this, you know, when I when I first got it, I, I really was like, wow, these are there's so many that I wanted to try, and like I bookmarked a bunch, you know, because I was like, oh, these flavors sound amazing and and then mixed with the uniqueness of, of the, the designs too. It's like this, she sure got something, this Lauren. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I really wanted people to feel like they could get value out of every aspect of the book. So whether it's flavor or design or, you know, tips and stuff that, you know, 
all of that would feel valuable. And I also wrote this book in a way that you can mix and match a lot of the crust with the fillings and the doughs and the designs. So, you know, maybe one tart has a parallelogram design with dragon fruit. Um, I hope that people will either make that tart or make that tart and make it their own. And maybe they'll do the design with kiwi instead or mango and pair it with a different crust. So um, it's kind of like, here are some basic recipes and basic formulas for you to create some of these art pieces. But uh, my hope is also that people will also kind of reframe how they think about pies and tarts and how they approach it and really make their creations their own. Love it. Okay, do you have baking or pie making idols? If so, who? Oh my gosh, Lindsay, obviously. I love the way that she weaves humor and um, just this like cute factor into what she does. Um, who else? I'm really loving Carla Vasquez from Salvi Soul right now. So as I mentioned, I have family background in Honduras and she's doing so much work in getting out, you know, information about food and um, culture on El Salvador. And I just love seeing kind of Central America come onto the scene or, you know, people amplifying the food and the culture and kind of mainstream. Uh, I grew up you know, people have had never heard of Honduras or don't know what the food is. And um, I just, I love seeing people, especially women out there in the food space, kind of um, highlighting these cultures and foods that I find really special and um, are putting it in the spotlight. Uh, who else? Um, obviously, Julie Jones, if we're talking about pies, she makes really beautiful pies. She's in the UK. She has a very distinct, like very feminine style. Um, her stuff is really super pristine. Um, other food people. Lisa Lin makes um, lots of dumplings, lots of Asian food that for me feels really nostalgic to um, the kind of food that my dad's side of the family makes um, and eats. Um, and pretty much every photo she puts up, I'm like, oh, I need that right now. Um, so good. And then there's a woman named Lokalani Alabansa. She um, started saturated ice cream and she makes these Ooh. ice creams that have flavors that are so wild and like right up my alley. Like she has that same brain where she's always trying to push the envelope, trying to do things that are really different and unique. Um, and I just really love her work. Um, after this, will you email me all those people? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> awesome. Um, there's just a couple more questions here. One of them is, do, is there other, other pies besides the mac and cheese pie that kids would, would enjoy from Pyometry? Or do you have a couple in there that... Oh, Probably, kids. Maybe, I mean, uh, the, sorry? The meat pie that you have, I've forgotten. Oh, the tomatillo short rib. Yeah, um, that's like the kind where like the vegetables are hidden. So maybe a <laughs> child is picky. There's vegetable juice in the crust and like hidden among the meat chunks. So that could be a good one. Um, I think a lot of the tarts are really fun because they are like geometric shapes and I call for a lot of shape cutters. So that could be a fun activity um, to do with kids um, where they get to like punch out the fruit with you or even with the dough. Um, and then um, Simone asks the most challenging pie and tart to master that you feel is the most challenging. Ooh, good question. Um, I don't know. I had a few disasters that obviously didn't make it into the book, but I also like haven't had a lot of experience with like alternative baking with like vegan, gluten-free, and I think that's kind of next on my list to experiment with and conquer. Awesome. And there's a final question, which is, uh, on average, how long does it take you to create one of your pie tops? I've asked, I've been curious about that too. Yeah, it really depends. Uh, some of the designs, like my spoke one, it actually comes to get like the actual design execution. It's like 10 minutes. Um, 
yeah, I mean, like you cut the strips and then literally laying the strips on this pie surface is really quick and straightforward. Or like my hand sliced tart, that's pretty iconic. That also comes together pretty quickly. Um, but then there are like the woven ones that are a little more time intensive. They require a little more dough. Um, and especially if I'm baking in the summer and it's super hot in my kitchen, I have to keep popping it in the fridge to chill, bring it back out, and that will take a little bit more time. So, you know, sometimes they can take anywhere from 30 minutes to a couple hours, um, really depending. And, you know, sometimes the entire process of building a whole pie can be very lengthy but not all of it is active time. So some of it's just like waiting time, waiting for it to chill in the fridge, waiting for it to rest in the fridge again, and then waiting for it to freeze or waiting for it to bake, um, so. Okay, um, another person asks, the pumpkin spice pie you made for Starbucks, was that a recipe or do you, did you also make the pie for them? Um, yeah, I developed that recipe for them. They basically sent me some of their pumpkin spice flavored coffee and asked me about, yeah, it was really fun. They asked me about my fall traditions, which as I mentioned, I have a pretty unique family background. We don't typically have like traditional, I mean, we went to the pumpkin patch, but you know, for Thanksgiving, it's always a mix like fried rice and turkey plus flan plus enchiladas and ceviche and paella yeah. maybe. So um, I got to fuse, um, you know, the flavors of my family's flan with a traditional pumpkin pie recipe um, to kind of create this whole new pie that showcased the Starbucks product, but also felt like me trying to twist flavors and also, you know, all kind of encompassed into this one pie package. <laughs> so Lauren, it is just a little bit after six and I just wanted to, number one, say congratulations again on your thank book. Thank you. So thank you for doing this. Um, and thanks for and, chatting with me. And one, like one last or like final tips for, for those who are gonna dive into, into pie making. Any, any sort of additional thoughts or tips? Yeah, I would just say jump right in and have fun. I started this journey, I started making pies because I really enjoyed it and I loved it. Um, and I want people to feel like that process is also fun and enjoyable and not, you know, a burden or something to be feared. But um, yeah, jump in, have fun with it. And I cannot wait to see all the things that people are going to bake from this. Tag, tag local kitchen or pyometry? Yes, tag me so I can see all your beautiful masterpieces. <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much. Thank you. Should I throw it back to Book Larder? Yes, thank you so okay. much, ladies. Um, that was so much fun to listen to. Um, thank you to our attendees who tuned in and watched. Again, you can buy signed copies um, through Book Larder. I've included the link in the chat. You can also just head over to our website and you can also purchase Lindsay's book as well. They're also signed. Um, if you want to get into cake territory, um, it's all just a lot of baking fun. So again, <laughs> ladies, thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.